Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. We want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, we also are excited to welcome back uh, an old friend, a former fellow. David Keene was a fellow before this building was constructed, uh, before almost everybody except a few of the mid-career students were probably born. The IOP was housed in a little yellow house up on uh, Brattle Street, kind of across from where Boloco is now. And so uh, that's where David was a fellow. We're excited to have him back, and we're also excited to have tonight's forum moderated uh, by IOP fellow John King, you all know from CNN. John is going to be spending a couple days a week for several weeks during this semester, and is leading a study group that I believe begins tomorrow. So tomorrow at 4 o'clock, you'll have to come by and see John. So please join me in welcoming John and David. Thank you, Trey. It's great to have a full house in the forum tonight. Let me just, a uh, couple of quick organizational things, and then we'll get straight to the conversation. I'm going to talk to David for about 20 minutes or so, then this is your forum. We'll open it up to questions from the floor. I'll say this once more, and we get to 20 minutes. It's really important. I know this is an issue in which people have a lot of passions. Uh, I've known David for a very long time. It's very gracious of him to be here. Uh, we want to have feisty conversation. We want to have a provocative conversation, but please, when you get up, ask a question. If you want to make a quick statement first, make a quick statement first, but make it a sentence and then get to a question. That's what we want to have a discussion. Uh, we're not here for speeches. Uh, that being said, what I'm going to try to do over the next 15 or 20 minutes is set the table on some of the issues that are before us now in the public discussion from the president and others. And David will articulate uh, his views and the NRA's views, and then we'll get to your questions. And so I want to start with this simple question, the threshold question. Uh, we have seen in recent years, Columbine, more recently Aurora, Sandy Hook. Is it the NRA's just flatline position that we need no new gun restrictions? That gun laws just should not be looked at, period? Well, you can always look at them. There's no problem with that. Uh, we review these things. For example, we think that the National Instant Check System, the NIC system, which we supported early on and which we've, we've in fact had to go back to Congress to get money to run because it's been cut down in various budgets over time. It's not working as well as it should work. It should be improved. And you know, for some years, it's been our position that those who've been adjudicated to be potentially violently mentally ill should be in that system. As far back as 1993, uh, Wayne LaPierre, our executive vice president, appeared on Face the Nation with then Congressman Charles Schumer of New York mm -hmm. and said, we've got to do something to get these people, who are the folks that are generally responsible for the mass killings. We have two different kinds of things. We've got criminals who use guns, right. and then we've got these kinds of folks. Right. Uh, and Schumer got up, shook Wayne's hand, and said, I can help you with that. That was 1993, and today over 20 states refused to put any of that data into the system. Uh, Mark Kelly, uh, Gabriel Giffords' yeah. husband at the Judiciary Committee hearing, said there are over 100,000 people in Arizona alone, both felons and uh, the, the people who've been adjudicated to be severely mentally ill who have not been put into the system. So it doesn't work, hasn't worked, and should be improved. The other thing that uh, needs to be done, frankly, is we need to start prosecuting federally gun crime because we have the laws to deal with criminal use of firearms, and we don't do it. I was astounded uh, at that very Senate Judiciary Committee meeting uh, when the uh, uh, chairman, Senator Leahy, said he was going to put in a law to make straw purchasing illegal because we needed such a law. It's a felony, a federal felony, uh, to purchase a firearm for a prohibited person. And it contains, it includes a mandatory five-year sentence in federal prison. And the fact that we don't prosecute anybody under those laws doesn't mean that the laws don't exist. So what we need to do is really look at the prosecution of gun crime and go after it in a big way. The other things are not firearms related. Uh, that's the mental health system, which has been dismantled and which is a real problem. Uh, and the fact that uh, we do need security in places where, where these kinds of folks are likely to appear. On the universal background check question, the NRA was for it in 99. Uh, Mr. LaPierre and others have said no when the president proposes it now. Why is the NRA against what it was It depends on, what you, on how you define universal. Um, and in 1999, we had, they were talking about the gun show loophole, the so-called gun show loophole. And uh, the uh, argument or the characterization was that gun shows were just this wild west place where anybody could go get firearms and they didn't have to undergo a background check. That was never true. 
about 90% of the firearms sold at gun shows are sold by federal licensees. And if you buy from a federal licensee, you're required to go the next check. At that time, we said, you know, if you want to have a universal check at the gun shows, all the BATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, has to do under existing law is set up a table and require that any deals, trades that take place on the premises have to undergo a background check. And they said, we're not going to do that. We don't want to do that. Uh, and they wouldn't. And that was, an, and, and the reason, of course, was this was during the Clinton years. And the, the goal was not to check people's background. It was to close down gun shows. And so they refused to do it. They've refused to do it since then. But that worked. The other thing that's different today is on the system is we believe that that system has to be fixed. For example, there are two things that are wrong with it. The president, uh, they've used various figures in different speeches, but the president said that since its inception, uh, about two and a half million uh, prohibited persons have been prevented from buying a firearm under that system. The Justice Department figures say that the number is about 900,000. The rest of them, the 1.5 million, are what we call, or they call, Justice Department calls false positives. In other words, people whose names are the same or that somehow get caught up in the system and get denied their Second Amendment rights, not because of anything they did or anything in their background, but because the system doesn't work. Uh, secondly, the system has from time to time gotten clogged up uh, so that uh, instead of being instantly checked, it takes days or weeks to get it, to get it fixed. But thirdly, and this is the most important thing, uh, even under the Justice Department figures, uh, there have been a lot of felons and fugitives from justice who have been caught in the system. And yet, in one recent year, uh, there were 76,000 people who were prohibited from buying firearms under that system. Forty of them were prosecuted, and 13 of them had plea bargains so that they were guilty of something. Now, if you're a felon, the first question you would ask is, why would you, if you know that it's a federal felony for you as a felon, to purchase or possess a firearm, why would you go to Walmart and try and buy one? You would go there not because you're necessarily stupid, although there are stupid felons, obviously. Uh, you go there because the system doesn't work very well and you might get away with it. And if you don't get away with it, it's a free shot. And then you go to the secondary market and buy your gun on the street or wherever. Our position has been that before you start expanding this system, you need to make it work. Well, well let, what if? This issue is front and center. The president wants to make it a priority. Uh, obviously, your organization opposes most of the specifics of what he says. One of the, well, this is one of the issues, and one of the reasons I said what I said about speeches at the beginning, in which, from my experience, people just refuse to have a conversation. You know, one side sets up and says yes, the other side sets up and says no, and they won't have a conversation. If you're invited to the table, can you foresee a scenario where you will say yes? There can be universal or near universal background checks as long as they listen to your concerns about the speed, the technology, and what you would describe as well, you know, just, the hiccups or falls. Sure, just system. as an example, I mean, one of the problems that we have is one, uh, it doesn't work, and you don't want legitimate citizens who have every right under the Second Amendment to purchase and, and own a firearm burdened or restricted as a result of those kinds of things. One senator talked to me and said, Well, you know what we ought to have? And I said, What's that? He said, we ought to, you ought to have an app on your iPhone. And if you want to buy a firearm, you just push the app, and in 90 seconds, um, you get approved or disapproved, and then you can go forward. And I said, I'm going to ignore the fact that in your state, not everyone has an iPhone. And that if they did, in many parts of your state, I won't name the state, they wouldn't have service. But that sounds great in principle. I said, why don't you design that system and test drive it in Massachusetts for two or three years, and we'll see if it works. You know, the, the, one, the one agency that's been, been unable to utilize money to improve its computer system is the FBI. When the NICS system was sold to us and when we endorsed it, it was basically on that kind of a theory. If we just set this up with modern technology, we're not going to burden anybody. You know, it'll be instant, we'll be taken care of, and that was a long time ago, and it hasn't happened yet. Is it theoretically possible? Sure. Uh, but when you, absent that kind of sort of pie in the sky thing, I was talking to a senator who said, you know, well, we ought to do this. And of course, even the president has started by saying he would exempt family members uh, from any kind of universal system. Now, that's about half, almost half of all private sales now are family members. So 
universal depends on you say, but I, he said, I said, well, what happens, Senator, when you go home? Doing it at a gun show is easy. I mean, doing it at a site is easy. What happens when you go home to your farm and you buy a new shotgun to go duck hunting and your neighbor says, um, I'd like to buy your old one? And you say, well, that's a good idea. And then you tell him you're going to have to get in a car and you have to go to a federal office and you have to go all through this stuff. And he looks at you and he says, Senator, we've known each other since we were four years old. Is he going to be happy having to do that? Or is he going to be happy knowing that he has to do it because you voted to have him do it? I mean, it gets, you get to a point where there are practical, real-world problems with doing this sort of thing. And, and, and this current system was really set up after extensive hearings that Birch Bayh, who was then a senator from Indiana, ran uh, back in the uh, 80s. Because under the old system, where there was no definition of who was and wasn't a dealer, individual prosecutors were in fact indicting parents for selling firearms to their kids, were in fact uh, gun collectors were being hauled into court. And by had extensive hearings and they came up with this and, and their argument then was that we're not talking about fathers giving their sons to their sons their firearms or grandfathers doing that or selling it to your cousin or your in-law. And we're not talking about that neighbor over the back fence. We're talking about arm's length private transactions, which turn out to be about 3 or 4% of all of them. So the question is, can you get to that without burdening everyone else? Now, in the perfect world, as the senator said, if we all, maybe, they, maybe President Obama will give us all an iPhone, and they'll develop this app, and it'll work, then theoretically, there'd be a way to do it. But we want to see how it works in the real world. A lot more ground to cover, but on this issue, background checks, which seems to be the part that has the most support. Uh, maybe the president wouldn't get universal, but Leader Cantor has said, you know, look at the Virginia law, which they put in after Virginia Tech. Uh, just today, a Republican congressman from, from Nevada, who has been on your side on many of these issues, Joe Heck, said he could support universal background checks. Again, will, the, will the NRA target, punish, seek to punish members of Congress who decide to change their position or decide to vote yes on these issues? It depends on where this all comes out finally, but the answer is yes. Now, when we look at that, one, again, like with President Obama, what does he mean? We don't know. Universal isn't right. universal, even with Barack Obama, so it may mean something less to him. Uh, but the fact is that we're going to look at this, and we are involved in conversations with a lot of congressmen and senators on both sides of the aisle, as you well know. And we don't foreclose any kind of conversation. Uh, but we will not support something which we, thinks, we think uh, burdens the innocent to try and find a very few who are guilty, uh, nor interferes with Second Amendment rights. If what they're talking about is trying to deal with some of these real world problems, then we're there. We're at the table. My, my dad was a jail guard. Uh, we had a couple rifles. We had a pistol in the house. I learned to shoot when I was a kid, both from him and in Boy Scouts. I, I get and respect and actually believe deeply in the Second Amendment. However, when it was drafted, the founders could not have envisioned, those were the days of muskets, uh, they could not have envisioned the technology of today. Explain to a parent in Sandy Hook or a parent or a spouse in Aurora, a family member, why someone should be able to buy an assault weapon. What's an assault weapon? A semi-automatic weapon that can fire 30 or 50 or 100 rounds. Well, not the, the, the Michael Bloomberg says it's a machine gun, he goes, <laughs> as he said on the air. And a a so-called assault weapon is not a military weapon. It's not designed for the military. It's a semi-automatic semi version built on the same platform. Uh, semi-automatic uh, firearms have been commonly sold in this country for over 100 years. Uh, and the AR-15, which is the right. most commonly sold uh, uh, semi-automatic so-called assault weapon. Magazines usually 20, sometimes 30. But not 100. That's for right. 22s. Right. They won't work otherwise. But the fact of the matter is that this is the, the most popular long arm in the United States. It's, as the Supreme Court would say, it is widely and commonly used by millions of Americans for perfectly legal purposes. It's the firearm that's most used for fi firearms training. It's most used in competition. It's used for home protection, and it's used uh, for hunting. So those are, in most states, it can't be used for deer hunting because it's not powerful enough. It's not a, it's not a big game rifle. Uh, but it is used in varmint hunting in, in a lot of the South and all of that. So, it's, so under the 
under the Heller decision, it's probably unconstitutional to ban it because they said that kind of a firearm can't be banned. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that any killing is tragic. If you look at statistics, and statistics don't obviously never tell the whole story, but in any given year, more people in this country are beaten to death, according to the FBI, than are killed by all long arms combined. That includes the so-called assault weapon. It includes shotguns and rifles and the like, semi-automatic and bolt action and everything else. So statistically, this is a firearm that's owned by millions of people, is very rarely used for illegal purposes. Uh, and so we, we're talking about banning it, really not to prevent crime, but to feel good. Because the, the, the bans on, the, on this weapon, on this firearm, are bans based on cosmetics. Uh, and that's what, you know, Dianne Feinstein would, would ban 157 different firearms that she thinks look like military weapons. Uh, and it's all based on cosmetics. They can't ban them on function because they function the same way as my shotgun when I go duck hunting. So what they've done, literally, and her staff did this, is they went through and looked, picture, looked at pictures and said this one should be banned, that one shouldn't. So that the same gun, the same gun without a pistol grip will be legal, with a pistol grip, it won't be legal. And the question is, what does that do? It doesn't do much of anything, just as the last uh, so-called assault weapons ban had no impact. And, and the, her complaint was, well, they got out of it by changing the cosmetics. Well, when your definition is based on cosmetics, what a shock. Let, let's go back to that period. We had what I'll call an assault weapons ban, a semi-automatic weapons ban. For 10 years. For 10 years, 1990-2004. When this is proposed now, uh, your executive director, Mr. LaPierre, says there would be dire consequences. What were the dire consequences from 1994 to 2004? Millions of Americans, not somebody who didn't want to buy such a firearm or didn't want to use it, but millions of Americans were disadvantaged in, in, uh, in buying the kind of firearm that they wanted to use to take to the range and the like. The National Shooting Sports Foundation has done a survey of the people who own AR-15s. 51% of them belong to shooting clubs. They go out to the range all the time. They're involved in competitions. They were disadvantaged, you know, and I, I've heard people say, well, um, I believe in the Second Amendment, but there's no reason we should have these guns or other guns. Well, I guess there's no reason somebody should have a Maserati either. But the fact that I might drive a Chevy doesn't mean that they shouldn't be able to have one. These people have these firearms and they use them and they enjoy it. You know, my daughter uh, is now in the Army Reserve. She did two tours of Iraq and one of uh, Afghanistan, and uh, she owns one firearm. It's an AR-15 because it, it's, she can tear it apart because she learned on the M-16. She goes to the range, she enjoys it, she doesn't enjoy anything else, uh, and she would have been disadvantaged by such a ban. And so is there, is there any middle ground? Is there, you can only have this particular style of weapon or this particular style of magazine if it is at a range and it has to be stored in a certain way. No, because you can way. use it for hunting, you can use it for plinking, you can use it for home protection. And those are legitimate purposes for the ownership of, fire, of a firearm. You can't own things that, uh, you, you know, you can't own a machine gun uh, unless you undergo a check that's more severe than you'd get if you went to the White House to work. Uh, that's basically dealers and collectors and police officers that have those. Uh, and they've been banned from common use since the 1930s. Uh, you can't own exotic weapons, uh, but the Supreme Court says you can own something like a, an AR-15. The rhetoric in all political debates, not just this one, and from both sides, I want to make that clear, from both sides, uh, sometimes wanders into hyperbole and beyond. Uh, I have an email here from Senator Rand Paul, um, writing under the headline of a group called Guns and Patriots, not the NRA. Uh, and he says, uh, Senator Feinstein's proposal, can only be described as a radical scheme and the effective end of the Second Amendment in America. Isn't that a little much? Pardon? Isn't that a little much? It's the a crippling end? of the Second Amendment. It doesn't end it. But if you can ban that gun based on its appearance, can't you ban other guns? For example, and it's always a mistake, not just for constitutional and legal reasons, but it's a mistake for <laughs> policy reasons to be making legislation at, at the height of an emotional moment. So we had the situation in New York where the governor of New York rammed through uh, gun control legislation uh, that nobody read, nobody had a chance to read, and it was passed. Uh, that legislation, he got into this thing about high capacity magazines. You know, somebody said, well, we shouldn't have 100 rounds. They go to seven, right? Shouldn't have 30. He said, I can do better than that. I'll make it seven. That, and with no grandfathering, 
and, with, and it can't have a magazine that could be converted to hold more or, or anything of that sort, uh, and they all have to be turned in within a year. That made inoperative 80% of the sidearms in New York, including all of them used by police. And I was talking to a police officer. He said, when I land, I'm a felon when I go home. He hadn't thought of any of those things. And what was the purpose? That's unconstitutional because the Supreme Court says you have a right to have a sidearm to defend yourself. And if you, he, he can say, I didn't confiscate them. I just turned them into useless metal because they don't make seven-round magazines for those kinds of guns. Uh, you don't make policy in that way. You look at it more carefully than that. And, and, and we're convinced, as in the past, that when you get beyond all of the emotion and you start looking at what works and doesn't work, uh, that you can find things. There was much in what the president said, not necessarily about firearms, because we reject the idea that it's the gun. You know, the president doesn't talk about gun crime. He talks about gun violence. Most gun violence is committed by gun criminals. And it's been our position all along that the way you deal with that, and this is different from the, from the mentally deranged who may involve themselves in a mass shooting, the way you deal with that is you punish gun crime. You know, it's a federal money today to rob a store with a gun. There's two separate crimes that are committed, the robbery, the armed robbery, and the use of the firearm. Chicago is now the murder capital of the United States. In Chicago, you know two things. The first thing you know is that because some of the strictest gun control laws in the country, that the pool of potential victims is essentially unarmed. In the federal jurisdictions, there are 90. Chicago is number 89 in prosecuting gun crime. So if you're a criminal, you know two things. One, if I want to go after him, he doesn't have any protection. And secondly, if I use a firearm, I'm not going to get any. But, but 12,000 people are murdered by guns in this country every year. It's your position that 0%, if we put that in a pie and try to slice it up, and you have criminals, you have repeat offenders, you have a, maybe a faulty background check system, you have mental health issues, that no piece of that pie is there are too many guns or it's too easy to get a gun. The fact of the matter is that uh, in most jurisdictions, for example, jurisdictions that have had past concealed carry laws, gun crime has decreased, not increased. It's not the gun. It's the person who misuses the gun. The, um, another thing that has been said by NRA leadership and by others in this debate is that this is a first step by the president, the Obama administration, for confiscation mm -hmm. and a gun take away. Uh, he's been president for four years. He proposed zero gun control in his first term, zero. Didn't lift a finger, didn't ask for a bill, didn't push a bill, didn't advocate a bill. Now he does. Where is the evidence that well, President Obama wants to confiscate your guns? If you go back... I can give you two pieces of evidence. One's historic, uh, and that is that, this, that Barack Obama, long before he ever ran for public office, I used to say before he thought about running for public office, but that's probably not true, uh, back in Chicago was an anti-Second Amendment activist. He was at the Joyce Foundation, which, as you may recall, was the foundation that actually went out and basically bought law reviews and put people in to try and, and push this revisionist theory of the Second Amendment that it didn't guarantee individuals the right to keep and bear arms. In the, uh, in the Senate in Illinois and in his campaigns, he said he didn't believe any American had the right to privately own a firearm. He, uh, he co-sponsored legislation that would have made it illegal to purchase, possess, or sell a handgun in the United States. I mean, his record on that is clear. Now, he didn't do anything. One could argue he had other things on his plate uh, during that first term. And even during that first term, he didn't want to talk about firearms because there's some political danger in doing so. Mm -hmm. We felt during the campaign, I felt very strongly, that if he got a second term, he was going to do something if he found any reason that he could to go after Second Amendment rights. Let me give you that example. Uh, I was a delegate to the last UN Small Arms uh, Conference. Uh, that was during the Bush years. There was another one this time coming up to a treaty. They had a treaty basically finished, uh, and it would have gone to the president's desk in August. Uh, the White House, through the State Department, notified the UN that they would like it indefinitely postponed, uh, and the UN kindly did that. And then within hours of his victory speech in Chicago, another message went from the State Department that the president wants that on his desk as soon as possible so that he can sign it. Uh, and the UN is convening this next month to do the, the committee to do that. He didn't want it as a political issue because it was a volatile political issue and he didn't want to be involved in it. 
Uh, but we felt that after his reelection, he would, because this is one of the things that's always been as, on his agenda. Now, the question about where do these things lead, the, uh, the Justice Department, we, we, as you know, a memo was leaked from them to us last week, uh, which basically concluded that a universal background check would not be useful uh, in preventing crime or violence unless it was linked to a, to a um, national federal database of all gun, gun registration, which the president has said he's not for. Uh, but in fact, both Andrew Cuomo and Dianne Feinstein, before their bills were introduced, said that the way to make this effective was what they called a mandatory, a mandatory buyback. In other words, we know you have a shotgun or a 15, and if you don't sell it back to the government for whatever we say it might be worth, then we're going to come after you. Uh, and the Justice Department position on the so-called assault weapons ban was that that wouldn't work absent a mandatory buyback. And those are logical conclusions that was reached by justice based not just on history and, and experience here and elsewhere, but are consistent with what these folks have been saying for years. Now, the president may not go that far, or he may go that far. Our problem is that once you start down that road, that there is an end point, and we don't like it. We're going to get to questions in one sec. I'm going to ask one more. Uh, you, you know, what the NRA, rightly so, points to is the United States Constitution and the Second Amendment, which guarantees that right. Um, that is the backbone, the foundation of our democracy. Um, in a democracy, does public opinion matter? It always matters. So 92 percent of the American people in a recent New York Times poll support universal, again, they may not understand the complete description, but let's say support more robust background checks. Does that matter to the NRA? 63 percent support limiting the size of magazines you should be able to those buy. Yeah, those Does that numbers, matter? Sure, those numbers change from time huh. to time. And as I said well, earlier... In the case of 92 percent, is, is that sort of a no-brainer? Well, that's, as I said, that sounds logical. When you get into a discussion of it, it may not sound as logical to a lot of people. As I guess the sound. part of my question is, will you join the discussion if you're invited we to are the in table the discussion. and it's a healthy conversation? Or we is it would just join going to be no, and we if you went, vote for this, we'll defeat you? You went, we, we're up on the Hill all the time, as you well know. We're in that discussion. Uh, we, uh, we sent our federal affairs director to meet with the Biden task force, and the vice president said right at the outset, he said, the president and I have strong feelings on what we need to do about firearms, so that's off the table. Let's discuss other things. They only invited us, not for our input, not for our discussion, but so they could say, oh, yeah, we talked to those guys. In the president's statement, as you'll recall, it was, in my view, typical Barack Obama. He positioned himself as the most reasonable man in America with common sense solutions to whatever the problem was. This happened to be firearms. And all of those solutions would already have been adopted except for some evil force out there. That would be us. Uh, and so he began to try to demonize the NRA from the very beginning. That's a, that's a timed political technique. Uh, and it's very difficult, frankly, uh, to engage in a rational discussion with people who are out to uh, destroy you. And that's what he's trying to do. Well, let's get to our questions. I would agree with the premise without accepting that completely, that both sides are having issues with having an open, <laughs> having an open mind at the beginning of the conversation. Uh, let's get to our questions. And again, please, uh, Dave has been gracious with his time. If you have a position on these issues, don't be afraid to state it. Tell me who you are. Uh, you state your position if you want, but keep it in a sentence or two. You'll be surprised to learn then, this, that not everybody agrees with let's you. Let's have a question, Mark. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College, and this is obviously an issue that means a lot to me, and I'm, I'm sure to everyone here. So I, I'd like to ask you again about um, your opinions on uh, high-powered semi-automatic assault weapons. I know you touched on it briefly, but frankly, I wasn't very satisfied with um, your response. You claim that, quote, the bans were based that Congress passed or wanted to enact were based on, quote, cosmetics, and that, quote, they function like duck guns. But frankly, um, it's pretty clear that the, the facts are there that um, the tragedies at Newtown, the tragedies in Aurora, and so many other shootings could have been much, much less lethal uh, had these villains not had these uh, high-powered semiotic assault weapons. So I want to ask you, Mr. Keene, why? Why do you think the public needs to have these in their hands? Why um, is this, uh, you know, we all know that the Second Amendment guarantees rights to firearms, but why do they need these types of firearms while children continue to perish in the madness out there? Well, most gun crime and most gun violence is not committed with these kinds of firearms. And let me just, uh, first of all, the uh, AR-15 is not a high-powered 
assault weapon. The 223, the caliber that it uses, is illegal in many states for deer because it's not powerful enough for big game. Any deer rifle, indeed, as Joe Biden likes to point out, any shotgun uh, can be far more lethal uh, than one of these rifles. The reason that people should have a right to them is because they're legitimate to the Constitution. They enjoy them. Millions of people f uh, use them. Very rarely are, are they used for criminal purposes. And yet any killing is tragic, whether it's with knives or guns or semi-automatics or explosives or whatever. Uh, after the Aurora shooting, Governor Hickenlooper in Colorado said there wasn't anything wrong with our gun laws. The problem is there are people who are evil. And that's what we have to try to keep any guns out of the hands of. That's why we want to make sure that the mentally adjudicated are, in fact, included in the background check. But the firearm itself, it's very popular. It's very uh, widely used. In fact, you know, uh, one, of the one of the groups of people that use it, we do a lot of work with, um, with handicap shooters. Uh, and a lot of times they're recommended to use the uh, AR-15 because it doesn't recoil very strongly if you fired one uh, because it's got a pistol grip and they can use it and they use it in competition. So there are a lot of reasons to use it, a lot more reasons to make it legal than to not make it legal. So whether you or someone else doesn't like it, you don't have to buy one. I don't own one because they're so darned expensive. But the fact of the matter is that's not a reason why John shouldn't have one. Your question. Hi, thank you Mr. Keene for being here tonight. My name is Julia Conrad and I'm a senior at the college and when I graduate I will be a classroom teacher. And I have a lot of concerns about the NRA's recommendation to increase the number of armed officials within our public schools. And I'm curious if you would say that given that so many teachers and researchers alike agree that the presence of guns within schools negatively hurts the ability of children to learn, do you think that the right to hold a gun for Americans is more important than the right for our children to learn? Well, the two things are not related. We expressed an interest very, very early on. Uh, it, it just by coincidence, when Newtown happened in Connecticut, the next morning I was in Israel, and I was touring a facility where they trained security guards for their schools. Uh, in the 70s, in the 60s and 70s, they had a whole spate of, of school shootings in Israel, mostly by people who listened to different crazy voices than some of our crazy people. But the effect was the same. Initially, what happened is veterans came forward as volunteers to protect the schools. Ultimately, that transformed itself into a system where each school has to look to its own security, and they use private security forces, not military and not police. And virtually all schools in, in Israel have this. Uh, when we got back here and suggested that because you cannot, no matter how well you screen, no matter how, you, even if we were able to reconstruct the mental health care system in a way that provided treatment, you can't always predict, you can't always catch the people who might do something like this. So that security made sense. The initial reaction, as John will remember, was people said, you're insane. Then we pointed, I pointed out, as did Wayne, that while well, 30,000 schools have armed protection, uh, a program that was really begun by Bill Clinton, then defunded, and states and localities picked it up, but there are 135,000 schools. And what we suggested was that in every school, uh, the teachers, the administration, the parents, and the local authorities ought to talk about what is appropriate for that school and decide what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, security they needed. In his statement, uh, the president, after deriding the idea, announced that, well, he was willing uh, to pay for another thousand resource officers for schools. That doesn't solve the problem. But the fact of the matter is that we protect jewelry stores, we protect banks, we protect sports stadiums, we protect a lot of different places. Uh, and if our kids are as important as I think they should be, why don't we protect them? Let me, let me try a little exercise before I take the next question. Stay by just one second. One of the things you learn if you do what I do for a living and you travel to all 50 states over the years is that this is a very interesting, complicated 50-piece puzzle we have in this country. So uh, some of you have strongly held views. Uh, if you travel the country, you might find that uh, people disagree with you, which is one of the reasons I ask for respect <laughs> in the conversation. I just want to show a show of hands. <laughs> I just want to show it would be, well, it would be pretty boring. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> it couldn't have cable television. Um, I'd like a show of hands if you or from a household where somebody has in your lifetime owned a gun? Raise your hand. Mm -hmm. 
That's right. The national figure is about 47 percent of households. If, if, if you believe that no one should be able to purchase a handgun or a rifle, raise your hand. Okay, let's continue the questions. Um, Darren Rivas from the Business School. Um, I think one of your greatest assets is your influence as the NFA, as NRA. Your scorecard is a very effective tool with Congress. Would you consider adding items to your scorecard to push for increased spending on mental health, FBI spending, security, and Congress in the states? I ask this because a lot of your natural allies in D.C. are also against spending expansion and have supported cuts to these programs. So wouldn't it help your uh, power to uh, be a positive change on these issues um, where a lot of your opponents actually are big supporters? Great question. It is a good question, and it goes to, to the mission of the National Rifle Association. We often get criticized because we only grade people on things that are directly affected on the Second Amendment. For example, we could grade you if you were a member of Congress. We could grade you if you voted against appropriations to include the adjudicatedly potentially violent in the NIC system. We couldn't grade you on the basis of the general mental health care system as much as we might think that's important. Not because it isn't important, but because it doesn't go to our core mission. The strength of the National Rifle Association over its existence has been that we come from both parties, from all walks of life, from all kinds of different people, and that we focus on, on that issue and that issue alone. We get criticized, as John knows, for that. We were roundly attacked by the Republicans in 2010 because we endorsed about 65 Democrats. They were Democrats who voted with us. Uh, and uh, I've gotten calls from people, and, I'm, and, and as, as many of you know, if you, if, if, if you read the, my bio or whatever, I've been involved in conservative politics and Republican politics all my life. So I'd get calls and we were attacked on radio shows during that same cycle saying, you endorse somebody who's uh, pro-choice. And my answer is, what is it about a coalition you don't understand? We have one mission. And our effectiveness goes right to that mission. Uh, and, I've, and a lot of the people we endorse, I would vote to endorse them and not vote for them. Because when I vote, I vote on a lot of different issues. But I do think, and I, and I have to say this, whether or not we can grade somebody on it doesn't mean we don't discuss it. And one of the advantages, if there is an advantage, the silver lining of all this debate that's going on, is that there is now a focus on that very problem. And you're getting uh, people who are concerned about spending as well as others saying, you know, this is something that we've got to fix. Because I think that there's pretty much, even in that, uh, in, in Senator Leahy's uh, uh, hearings, which uh, started out on guns, about half the discussion was about the mental health care system. And that's not something we're going to grade on, but it is something we're very interested in. It's something that needs to be fixed. Please. Thanks. Hi, um, my name is Chanel Washington. I am a sophomore at the college. And um, shortly after the Newtown killings, after Obama um, announced that gun legislation would be made, your, your organization um, released an advertisement that called our president, quote, an elitist hypocrite because his daughters are protected by armed guards at their schools and he doesn't support more armed, armed guards in our schools. So um, my question is, can you please say in hindsight if you believe that advertisement was um, extremely um, an extremely bad piece of propaganda um, and completely inappropriate. Um, and speaking specifically right. to the content of the advertisement, because you already made um, your stance on armed guards and schools very clear. Well, our point was, and it's a very valid point, and it could be made, as I've said, in many different ways, but the fact is that, that and we, we've gone into this earlier in, in some states with concealed carry laws and bodyguards and the like, Many of the biggest opponents of Second Amendment rights have bodyguards, have armed bodyguards. Diane Feinstein used to have a concealed carry permit. She said, anybody messes with me, I'm going to shoot them. Uh, you know, they don't, the, the suggestion is it's okay for them to have guns, not for us. For security, many of the people who derided the idea of school security are elitists who, in fact, send their 
send their kids to, uh, to school, schools that have such security, often private schools. The president's children deserve uh, protection. So do other children. So, and that we don't decry that, we don't deny that, we don't think they shouldn't have it. We think that the same consideration for the safety of all our children is as important as it is for the, for the protection of the elites. Was the, was the tone of that a mistake in hindsight, though, to the question? I'm sorry? Or was the tone maybe in invoking the children, was that a mistake in hindsight? Or was this geared uh, not at uh, impressing her, but as in telling your members, we're going to fight? We are going to fight. But was that the point? No, <laughs> that's, that's our slogan on the, oh. on, the whole, on the whole question, we fight for your rights. Oh. But the point of there is that uh, we deserve and the American people deserve the same protection as the elites have. I, my, my fault for not going up sooner, I'm the idiot who was keeping the conversation down here. Go ahead, sir. Hi, um, my name is John. I am a junior at the college from Turkey. And I wanted to ask a question about the uh, arms trade treaty that you brought up at the UN. Um, I was actually in the room um, when our NRA Vice President LaPierre made a speech, and I think you've missed that bit when you said Obama tabled it, because he made a very aggressive speech saying he has 60 senators who have signed a particular uh, document that said they were going to oppose the arms trade treaty, and that was one of the reasons why there was a lot of pressure on Obama, and that's how he, despite the fact that he believes in it, I believe that's why he gave in to the pressure which was also inflicted upon by your group. Um, and I think you missed that when you said Obama kind of killed it and then it, well, my question is, um, what will change that stance of the NRA that has been obstructing the arms trade treaty at the UN? Yeah, it, before the election and this vote, I know because we monitor these things, 58 senators in both parties said they would not vote for the treaty as it was written and as it's proposed and they won't today. Uh, we have urged from the very beginning uh, that uh, privately owned, civilian owned, and sporting firearms be excluded from the treaty, and they have refused to do that time and again. And as long as that's the case, and as long as it requires, and it and arguably does require, a national registry, we'll oppose the treaty, and so will most members of the Senate, whether we take a position on it or not. More broadly, on the question of votes. Um, We'll see what happens in the committee hearings. But if something, if an assault weapons ban comes out of a committee, if a limits on magazines comes out of a committee, I'm speaking about the Senate, background checks, some expansion comes out of a committee, and there are 50 plus votes, but not 60 votes, will the NRA score people on supporting a filibuster, or will it say, let's have an up or down vote? We'll see. But I'll Sorry. tell you something, no. there, there will be votes. Because one of the things that's gone on in the last decade is there haven't been many votes, as you know, right. or any votes right. on, uh, on firearms uh, uh, questions. And therefore, uh, we are asked to grade people on their rhetoric and not on their performance. And this time, and one of the reasons that the Senate is reluctant to do anything, there will be votes. The President wants votes. Right. We want some votes. We may differ on which ones they are, but, but we'll be looking at these folks and asking how they vote, and so are their constituents. You know, the narrative of the... We should have the forum invite you back right before the 2014 election. <laughs> <laughs> Sir. Thank you, Mr. Keene, so much for uh, being here with us. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. Um, so I know the, the Aurora shootings, uh, the Sandy Hook shootings, really, really brought the uh, gun violence to the center of attention in America. But every day, um, there are places in America where gun violence is either an imminent threat or a danger right around the corner. And so I'm really interested in what the NRA thinks that the, uh, the federal government should do to stop the spread of particularly illegal handguns in urban environments in America. Okay, we, I mentioned earlier the problem in Chicago, yeah. uh, which is that gun crime is not prosecuted as gun crime. Uh, in the 90s, uh, the murder capital of the United States for some time was Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and again, gun crime was not prosecuted there. We went to Richmond and we basically struck a deal uh, with the U.S. Attorney, the, the uh, Justice Department ultimately didn't like the deal that he made, and with local prosecutors and law enforcement. And we, we launched something down there called Project Exile. Uh, and the deal was this, we would publicize it in Richmond and they would do it. And that was use a gun to commit a crime, go to prison. If you get arrested with a 
committing a crime with a firearm, or if you're a felon, or you're somebody that's been convicted before and you're prohibited from owning a firearm, they will take you to federal court and they will send you to prison. And gun crime dropped in Richmond precipitously. It was no longer the murder capital. In fact, the U.S. attorney said there were drug deals where the guys didn't have guns, where they always used to have them because they didn't want that extra five or ten years in prison for having them. If you're dealing with gun crime, with criminal use of firearms, you can deal with that by prosecuting criminals. And that's what we suggest is the first thing that needs to be done. Prosecution under the federal firearms laws during the Obama administration has dropped 35 percent. And he said in his statement that it's time to begin prosecuting these cases. Yes, it is. But when, for example, well, when we asked uh, at, these, uh, at, the, at the Biden task force about the, about the felons and prohibited people that try to buy a gun, and that's a felony for them to try and buy a gun, why weren't they prosecuted? Eric Holder said, we don't have time for that sort of thing. During the, in the 90s, Holder was again in charge of this stuff, and he said, going after these criminals is like going after guppies. We don't prosecute guppies. Well, uh, in New York City and elsewhere, they found out the way you clean up a city, you start with the guppies, and then you get the sharks. So we think that there is an answer to that, and we think it's been demonstrated, not just in Richmond, but elsewhere, and they could do it in Chicago, too. Please, your question. Good evening. Um, my name is Teresa Conrad. I'm a first-year Master of Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I'm, from, I'm not from the U.S., I'm from Germany, so for me this is probably a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to, to meet you face-to-face, -face. and so I want to um, actually apologize in advance for my potentially naive question, um, <laughs> which is... Um, you always, you very often refer back to the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution when arguing in, in favor of guns. And uh, my question is, do you think that today, if um, the Founding Fathers would live today, if, do you think they would still consider it necessary and constitutional, the Second Amendment? I mean, after all, it's not the Wild West anymore. <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> You know, the Second Amendment was, uh, was put in not to protect squirrel hunters, uh, but to protect the kind of society we live in. Uh, I like to, you know, about eight years ago in Moscow, uh, there was a um, dinner honoring General Kalishnikov. He's the man who, during World War II, was a tank driver but invented the AK-47 as one of the few heroes that Russia has. A lot of them were tainted by that 70 bad years they had. Uh, and so they had a, a dinner honoring him. Mr. Putin proposed the toast, and the little general got up, held his glass in front of him, and said, Mr. President, I dream of a country like the United States, governed by men and women not afraid of an armed citizenry. Pointed out that in the countries that became free after the Soviet empire collapsed, one of the first things they all did was legalize private ownership of firearms. So that's an, that's an important symbolic thing, and it's part of the culture of this country. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of people from elsewhere don't understand it, you know. And let me go back to it, and it's interesting because it's the same division for different reasons exists today. The NRA was formed in 1871 uh, by a, a group of union generals in New York. Uh, two of our first presidents were Ulysses S. Grant and Phil Sheridan. And they felt the NRA was necessary because they thought the Civil War lasted a couple of years longer than it should have because unions couldn't hit anything with their huh. guns. Uh, and the saying at the time was that a Confederate soldier was worth three Union soldiers, and the problem the Confederacy faced was there were five Union soldiers for every Confederate. But the problem that they saw was that the North in the Civil War was recruiting from the newly industrialized cities of the Northeast, and they were recruiting first-generation Europeans who came with no gun culture, no familiarity with firearms, and didn't really know much, and therefore they weren't able to act effectively as infantry, and they decided at that time that there needed to be training. For the first hundred years of our existence, the NRA was basically involved. We picked the Olympic teams, we trained people, we did all that, we taught gun safety. Uh, we've done that, we still do it. Today, when you ask somebody about the NRA, they will talk about our advocacy role. The interesting thing is until the 1970s, we'd never endorsed a candidate, we'd never given any political money, we didn't have a lobbying arm, and we didn't have lobbyists because there wasn't any need for it. 
because the Second Amendment was supported by everybody regardless of party. Hubert Humphrey was a life member of the NRA along with Dwight Eisenhower and the others. When the culture wars of the 70s developed, things changed. And our lobbying arm was actually formed at the insistence of John Dingell, who's still in Congress, who came to us and said, you know, you can train all the people you want in the safe use of firearms. You can talk about hunting, you can talk about competition, but you're not going to be able to do any of that unless you get on the, on the ball and, and fight for Second Amendment rights, which we've done ever since. And that really was a, was a morphing of the NRA into an advocacy group. But even today, we spend, in terms of our budget, about 10 to 12 percent, even in election year, on advocacy, lobbying, and politics. The rest of it goes to all of the things that we've been doing for over 100 years. It goes to the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the 4-H. It goes to equipping shooting teams in high schools and colleges. It goes to international competitions and running the national matches for competition in Ohio. So the NRA is very involved, but we know that without the Second Amendment, that all of the other things we do could come to naught. I just I want to keep the students' question. So just quickly, you don't think you mentioned, you know, obviously the founding fathers, the back to the Revolutionary War days. You mentioned the Civil War days. You don't think that they might, given the technology of today, think that it is reasonable to yes have a strong and firm Second Amendment, but a reasonable limitation on how many rounds a gun can fire in a certain amount of time. Well, you know, when they wrote the First Amendment, all they had were quill pens and handset type. And the First Amendment protects all the modern technology that's come but since there then. But are, there are reasonable restrictions. I might and, argue there and are reasonable instructions. We right. might disagree on that, but there are restrictions on the First Amendment. And there are restrictions uh, on the Second post Amendment. Post-9-11, we have a Patriot Act that puts restrictions on all Americans. Let's not get there, because uh, I'm not with uh, I get you. <laughs> I get, I'm not saying, but, there, you know, there's, but, but these things happen. There's no... There are, there are any right, any, any of the guaranteed rights, the First Amendment right. and the Second Amendment, come with the possibility of legitimate restrictions. But those restrictions are looked at very critically by the courts. Uh, and uh, it, it is not, in violation of the First Amendment, it is not simply a violation of this First Amendment to gag you. It is also a violation to put too great a burden on your ability to exercise mm -hmm. your right of free speech. The same is true with the Second Amendment. Let me give you an example since the Heller decision. The concealed carry law in uh, Maryland, one of the most restrictive mm -hmm. states, was struck down by the federal courts on the grounds that the restrictions that they put on granting a carry permit were too onerous uh, and, and in effect denied citizens their Second Amendment right to protect themselves. And they made another point which was that when you're dealing with a fundamental right, it is not right to require the citizen to demonstrate that he should be able to exercise that right. The burden has to be on the state to show that he shouldn't. So, and that's true with the First Amendment and the Second Amendment. So, yes, there's, even during the, um, and so with your even during after the Constitution, the state you couldn't possess a they? cannon. You know, you couldn't right. possess some weapons. Today, you can't possess some weapons. You shouldn't be able to. Uh, but but the, uh, the firearms that you can, Possess then and now were those that were commonly owned and widely used for legal purposes. Please. Hi, my name is Meg McHugh. I'm a freshman here at the college. Um, last year, I read a study published that said the largest decrease in drunk driving related fatalities were the states that had the strictest laws governing those. And the general public is um, generally receptive to the idea of taking on an additional burden or trying to do any measure that would help the problem. These laws didn't completely solve the problem, but they certainly helped the problem. And one of the arguments I hear from the NRA and people against gun control laws are that, that gun control laws would not completely solve the problem, that there are other pieces to the puzzle, whether it be a better prosecution of gun crimes or reforming the mental health system, which I completely agree with. But why when, as he stated, the general population is very receptive and supportive of some gun control laws, why would the NRA not be receptive at all to doing something that maybe not, might not solve the problem, but could have the potential to help curb this, um, these senseless tragedies? Your first analogy was exactly right. And that was that the way you reduce drunk driving crimes was to punish drunk drivers, not to c crush cars because it was the drunk driver who was driving drunk and misusing the car that was the problem. That's exactly analogous with prosecuting criminals who misuse firearms. It's not the firearm nor the car that's the problem, it's the person who misuses them. 
what, what they didn't. That had the uh, strictest laws yeah. governing regular drivers, not drunk drivers, but the ones that had the strictest laws um, governing just drivers in general. It wasn't the prosecution of drunk drivers. It wasn't taking their cars away from them. It was prosecuting under existing laws. I don't understand your. It wasn't like it was. They studied the states that had the strictest laws in place governing drivers and what the training kind of, of drivers. What? What kinds of laws? I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. What kinds of laws? It was the strictest driving laws. What does that mean? What? The ones that had the strictest, like, so for example, I live in Massachusetts, and I know other states, it's a lot easier to obtain a license. You don't have to go through as much training and as much, you don't have to go as much behind the wheel training or be in class. Well, that's training. different from prosecuting the misuse of the automobile. And there is a significant difference between, and the courts have found this, a significant difference between driving, which has always been considered a privilege, and owning a firearm, which is considered a right. And you can put different restrictions on a privilege than you can put on a right. Now, you may not think it should be a right, but it is. I, su I suspect if there were cars in the days of the Founding Fathers, they would have figured out something <laughs> on, 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 on that one. Sir. Uh, uh, Steve Helfer, Harvard Law School Library, retired. Uh, since I got up to this mic, uh, a couple of the points that I wanted to hear addressed have been touched on, but I'm going to ask you, there seems to be a reticence uh, on the part of everyone involved in the discussion, including the NRA and Barack Obama, among others, uh, about the reason for the Second Amendment. And it seems to me the reason for the Second Amendment is to empower the citizenry vis-a-vis -vis the government, not to disarm the citizenry, uh, to give the government pause when they know that they're dealing with an armed citizenry. Can you discuss that or can you talk a little bit about well, that? I think that uh, that's exactly what General Kalishnikov was referencing uh, in his comments to President Putin. Uh, the fact of the matter is that our history is such that uh, if, those, if those farmers in, in the 1760s and 1770s hadn't had those muskets over their fireplace, we'd still be a colony of Britain. Uh, and that's, that's where it all came from. And they felt that the safeguard against tyranny was for a citizenry to be armed. George Washington said a free people should always be armed. And you know, it's interesting because it protects all of the legitimate uses of firearms. Today, the, when we're talking about a free citizenry protecting itself, we're mostly talking about protecting your family and your community from disorder and from... Uh, uh, and from, uh, from criminals. But that's what it was all about, that's what it remains all about, and that's what's unique about this country. Uh, and it was unique then, and it's unique now. So uh, that's, that's the historical reality, and that's where it came from, and the courts have found that it is just as important today as it was then. Uh, I've been told by our masters, the organizers, that we're about out of time. In my first official act here as a fellow, I'm going to almost ignore them. Not quite. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, meaning, meaning, I'm going to take a few more questions. I'll try to do two or three more, but what I need then is just a question, please. Uh, be ver let's be very quick, sir. Uh, yeah, my name is Tom. I'm a junior uh, at the college. I just have a question. If you can explain a little bit more about the nature of your opposition to uh, high-capacity magazines. Because I watched the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee meeting that you talked about, and one of the Republican senators offered an answer, which was uh, an intruder came into someone's house, she shot six times, and that wasn't good enough. He still walked out the front door. And he said, what if there were two intruders? Shouldn't she have 15 rounds? Um, so is that the nature of your opposition as well? There are, there are two, um, two bases for it. That's one of them. This was a case... Uh, recently uh, where a, a woman had barricaded herself with her children, a fellow had broken in, she had a revolver, she shot, she shot him six times, she shot at him six times, she hit him five times, and he drove away. He could have killed her, uh, but he, I guess, you know, five bullets is enough to get to convince you that you ought to leave and not find out if she has another one. Uh, and his point, it was Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, he says, is it unreasonable of me to think that my family should be able to have at least the, the firepower of somebody attacking them. That was his argument. That's a very good argument. The other reason is uh, that a lot of these firearms that are particularly are used in competition uh, and, 
and, and the like are designed. So if, I mean, it, you can you could you could reload them with single shots, but it would take all day. It's not what they do. It's fun to shoot that way. They do it that way. But the but the Second Amendment position is both, and the real question was really hit as effectively by Lindsey Graham in that discussion before the Senate Judiciary Committee as anybody ever has. Sir, quickly. Uh, good evening, Mr. Keene and Mr. King. My name is Marcin Kostecki. I'm a junior from the college. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to come uh, visit and speak with us today. Uh, throughout your conversation, you've, you've discussed bans on certain kinds of weapons. For instance, in your discussion about machine guns, judging from your choice of words and, words and the tone of your voice, I'd venture to guess that you would be of the opinion that these weapons should not be available to the general public. Uh, that brings up the question, what criteria should be used to determine which kinds of weapons should be available for use and which ones uh, should not, should be illegal? Clearly, you've stated that cosmetics is not a good criteria. So uh, I'd like to ask what, for you, would be the dividing line between legal and illegal weapons? Well, since the 1930s, fully automatic weapons have not been available to the general public and shouldn't be. And the Supreme Court's position is that if it is just as in in the, the 18, or 1790s, if it is widely owned and commonly used for legal purposes, then it should be in the hands of the general public. Now that obviously means machine guns are not widely used, they're not commonly owned, they've been banned since the 1930s. Uh, in addition, you know, uh, Mayor Bloomberg once took the position in an interview that the NRA supports people owning rocket launchers, I don't know if you remember that. I don't know that rocket launchers are commonly owned and widely used for any purpose uh, by the American people. Uh, those are things that, those kinds of exotic weaponry are not something that anybody envisioned being in the hands of the civilian population. But the modern version of the musket is the semi-automatic rifle, or the bolt action rifle, or the pump action rifle. Uh, and those are legal under the Constitution and they're widely used, commonly owned for legitimate purposes and should be legal. Right, let me finish up here. Uh, hi, my name is Sylvia. I'm Director of Operations for the Forum Committee. For what? And Director of Operations for the Forum Committee. Um, one of our Twitter followers asked us today, um, why did the NRA advocates push legislation through Congress 20 years ago that prevents any federal money to be used for gun safety research, and how do you see that playing into the debate now? It was not a ban on research. In fact, the appropriations rider was put on the CDC because it was being used during the Clinton administration to lobby for and promote gun control. In fact, the language of the rider is that no, this is supposed to be illegal anyway for the federal government, but the language is that no funds may be used for lobbying or the public promotion of gun control. That's different from research, and a lot of research is done. That's a mischaracterization of that legislation or of that appropriations rider, which is what it was. So what would you uh, advocate now? I'm sorry, quickly. No, what would you advocate now about gun research? How gun research is being done, and it's being done by other agencies. It's, some of it's being done there. The, actually, the CDC is a very inappropriate place to be doing it. Back in the 90s, there was this whole thing about how, remember, uh, that uh, people who uh, owned firearms were somehow sick. And uh, the Clinton administration, actually, the CDC said this is some kind of an illness, uh, you know, which is a little patronizing, I would think. But the fact is that, that they then used this to argue that, uh, that to fight disease, the disease of liking guns and enjoying them, you had to have some kind of government action. That, that limitation was put on so that they could not lobby uh, for gun restrictions, and they're not allowed to do that now. They can study anything they want. I'm sorry, our last question has to be from up here. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Uh, my name is Sophie Kim. I'm a second year student here at the law school and um, the Kennedy School of Government. Um, my question is, uh, Republican pollster Frank Lutz recently came out with a statistic that 74% of NRA members support criminal background checks. And what is your response to the accusation that the NRA leadership no longer accurately represents its membership and is instead representing the gun lobby and the gun okay. industry. That's part of the administration's narrative that they hope they could sell to the public and to Congress. And uh, the so-called poll uh, was sponsored by Mayor Bloom Group and is not a poll of NRA members. He doesn't have access 
to the NRA membership list because we don't let it out. Have you, but, polled, have you polled your own members? Pardon me? Yes, have we polled, have polled our members. Would you, and release, our members them, would you release them publicly with the methodology? They, pardon me? Would you release the polls publicly We have released with the it. You can get it on the internet and you can get all the background from it. The background it. of the yeah, background. Okay. It's all there. That's the, it, but to, to go to the rest of it, there's also the charge, uh, which we've heard from the Bloomberg group, and I had, I had us look into this, that we no longer represent gun owners. We no longer represent hunters and sportsmen and collectors and self-defense people. We represent the gun industry, and we're only interested in selling firearms. We got, in the, in the last five years, uh, in each year, no more than 4% of our income, our revenue, uh, from the gun industry. Now, if they're, we're going to be accused of that, I wish to heck they'd step up to the plate and give us some money. Uh, we don't represent the firearms industry. We represent the consumer of firearms. We represent the members. Now, if, if we want to vote on, if, if we want to look at our popularity, not only, uh, and I did, uh, we used to say that we had a higher favorability rating than Congress, but I had to stop saying that because we could be serial rapists and have a higher combina uh, favorability than Congress. But at present, we still have a higher favorability rating than President Obama. Uh, and what's more important is that if you look at our membership. I, I, I referenced earlier the fact that while we have four and a half million members, the Gallup poll shows that 30 or 40 million people consider them members. When we have this kind of a crisis that's going on now, uh, what happens is that a lot of those people say that uh, the NRA is uh, fighting for our rights and we better join up. And that's what's happening. We, we entered this with about four million members. We now have four and a half million uh, and uh, we've had to add all kinds of people, and we're not even, we're not even in a recruitment mode, uh, but we've had to add all kinds of people because our phones are tied up 24-7 with people joining the NRA. Uh, well, so I think sorry. that gun owners are voting with their, uh, by joining us and that, that we represent them, and they know that. I want to thank you for your questions, and I want to apologize for not getting to those of you who are waiting. We are out of time it's here. because I talk uh, too there much. Is a, there is a venue for, I guess, some of us to continue the conversation after. But I just want to close by thanking you all for your time, your patience, and your respect. I want to thank David for his time and his taking questions from many people who disagree with him. I think that's important. This, this debate is front and center before the country. We'll see where it goes to someone who's been in Washington a long time. I don't think the president's going to get uh, exactly what he wants and probably not much of what he wants, uh, but there will be votes. And we'll watch this go forward, uh, both in a policy sphere and then how it turns into the political sphere. And I think as it does, it's great for the forum uh, to have a distinguished guest like David. And again, I think David was very gracious with his time. And so please, a round of applause for our guest and thank you all for being here.